Hey y'all everybody, in this volume we're going to be covering Giants and Ogres of the Enchanted World. This one of course is pretty obviously what it's about, Giants and Ogres of various kinds. Okay, funny thing about this one, as I was, I was growing up with these, with the Mother's Collections, and this is, and when I finally got this volume from Amazon, this is the first time that some of these come with dust covers. My mother's copies never came with dust covers when it came in the mail. So, um, they usually come like this. You know, as you see, in, you know, this is a kind of normal look for them. I'm going to take this off. But I guess the good thing about with the dust cover here, this is actually quite a superb copy. You know, this the um, engraving here is just intact. Um, off the side here, it talks about it. You know, oh, beautifully done. No wear and tear on the picture. Granted, my copy does have a couple of press marks here and there. But that's nothing. I, you know, enjoyed these when they were in worse conditions. So uh, here we go. Let's see about Giants and Ogres. All right. And of course, as I said before, the, when the title pages come in, they have these little kind of cartoonish little things that sort of tell something about, you know, an event that's happening. Um, in this case, I see, you see a giant on the landscape. He looks like he's playing with Legos or, you know, looks like it, but it's actually, he's going to be building here. He's actually building a castle. You know, he's, he's getting there and then you know, he pushes a finishing top, you know, finishing um, top on it. You know, looks magnificent. But then if you go to the last page, that's where you get the final piece. You know, boom. He just wrecks it. <laughs> you know, what you do with your board. All right, so the first one. Um, here we go. We got a farmer with a giant, hand, you know, plowing his field um, with his ox. And he gets a hand, you know, about to grab him. This talks about a little story about um, of a farmer getting abducted by some giants who sort of find him an, an oddity and amusement. And here we go, here he is. Of course, on the bottom here, um, it reads, um, uh, I'll try and, again, sorry about the glare, my lighting is terrible here. Um, here we go, it does not there. Um, plucked from his field and taken into to a giant's abode high in mountains, an Austrian farmer found himself in the role of a living toy, a plaything exhibited on, on a tabletop. You know, they, you know, they have their amusement, you know, nothing cruel or anything, you know, but then they eventually take him back. And, of course, it talks about, in this first chapter here, it talks about uh, giants in the as an ancient people so, um, before mankind, even before the gods. In this case, the classical painting by Francesca Goya of, of Saturn eating his children. I always love this picture, macabre as it is. Um, the caption here on the bottom says, The giants who ruled the cosmos at the dawn of time feared of beings born after him. Thus the titan Kronos devoured his sons so that they might not become his conquerors. And of course, this is talking about um, the Greek mythology of Zeus who will eventually kill Kronos and eventually rules the gods. But, you know, also, in, you know, we also talk about Orion. Um who is a son of Poseidon. He was a giant himself. And um, yeah, on the top it reads here is a, um, let's see, here we go. Uh, guided by a mortal, the giant Orion searched for the healing light of dawn. He was blinded, so he was on a journey to get his eyes healed. And he was a very handsome, skilled hunter. He attracted the uh, the love of a nymph and a goddess Artemis, of course, because um, Artemis got jealous. She killed him, but out of um, grief she, you know, Put him up as a constellation. The overall, you know, painting between two covers. It's quite nice. It's quite nice. I need to see if I can better find position this. Now, how many people know about this one? You see a giant's head over here, but also in his hand is an ark. Well, well wait a minute. Is it Noah's ark? Yes. But um, up at the top it says both Hebrew and Arab chronicles tell of the giant Og who walked beside the ark of Noah when waters covered the earth and cleansed of its sinners. Um, yeah, you don't read about this much in any form of, of Noah's Ark that you, you know, that you read about. And according to this, he, um, not only helped the Ark find, you know, find safe passage through the waters, he got to rule his own kingdom with many cities under him, and was later killed off by Moses. <laughs> if that's in the Bible, let me know. Okay, let's go on. Uh, of course, like the Greeks, the Norse gods also have talk about giants and like the Norse gods um, the giants came before him and had great power this one's a famous story about Thor 
um, along with Loki and a few others, try, you know, they try, go to a um, cave to stive off, you know, the cold, and they found out that the cave, you know, cave was actually a, a giant's glove. On the top here, you know, on the upper part, Norse gods were first challengers of, of giants, although the size of one um, one could give give them pause. Um, on one adventure, Thor and three companions made camp in a giant's glove. <laughs> You know, you hear about this a lot. Of course, in a further adventure here, you know, we see Thor uh, trying to unwrap this bundle here. The sheltering glove turned out to belong to the giant Skymir. Thor um, sought food from the sleeping giant's sack, um, but the thong that bound the bag was held fast by magic. In this story, Thor tried to do whatever he can to attack the, um, the giants. Um, they challenged him, you know, they challenged him and many others in the, in the um, in a huge fortress, but they couldn't do anything because their, their magic was all tricks they would just sort them here's one example see thor right here you know he's he's smashing you know, tr you know with his uh, hammer mole year which can destroy all villages and on top it says even thor's hammer of heaven a weapon that could destroy whole villages with thunderbolts had no effect on skymere but this too was giant's magic needed against the growing power of gods and men so yeah you know when we think of giants we just think it's big strong monstrous dumb beasts but they're all but back in the old mythologies they were creatures of great power now here's one. Um, on the top here, it mentions the first giants were masters of changing shape, and none more so than Theosi, who became I'm sorry for my who became an eagle and dragged the god Loki across mountain crags and glaciers until he divulged the secret of immortality. Yes, that is Loki. Sorry, it's not Tom Hiddleston, but you know, artist interpretation and all. And of course. Uh, eventually, Loki overcame this um, giant here on the top of the caption here. His mighty wings um, devoured by flames, his eagle's body split by lance and axe. Theosi perished at the hands of the gods of Asgard, their stronghold in the clouds. In time, even mortals would aspire to the conquest of such formidable foes. So, yes. Um, oh, it's still a good picture all the same. And let's see, it's going on here. Oh, I love this part of this book. This one, you gotta turn it sideways. You see these cool art pictures here. Um, and he got captures on the bottom there. I'll try to pose the, to where you read the picture, you see the picture. And yes, it's just a bunch of, it looks like a dark at night, mountains here, you see eyes in the clouds. Heirs of the first world, the earliest giants were true sons of heaven, arising from the misshrouded chaos at the beginning of time. In ancient Norse belief, the first creature to stir in the cosmos was the frost giant, giant Ymir, born of the warring kingdoms of fire and ice, when stray sparks melted a glacial flow and quickened it into life. Ymir's body spawned a whole race of frost giants, and her offspring, the gods, soon followed. In time, the hoary progenitor of all living beings was sacrificed to create the ordered universe of earth and sea and sky. Many are ver many and varied were the giants' descendants of Ymir, as these pages show, but all came into perpetual, eventual grief, sorry, undone by the gods and fate of humanity. So we go to the next page here. Aha, uh -huh, I see. Uh, this kind of looks familiar. Pillars of the Heavens. In punishment for mutiny against the gods of Greece, the Titan Atlas was condemned to spend all eternity on the, as a living pillar. His massive arms he held back to kick um, the starry curtains of the heavens so that it would not fall and crush the fragile earth. His name fitted his, um, his task, Atlas meaning enduring. So, try to shut us out all that glare. <laughs> Uh, this one we gotta turn sideways for. Right, here we go. Looks like a sleeping you know, giant here. A torpid terror. A formidable sleeper was a giant Kubakarna, fearsome warrior of Hindu legend. A mountain was his pillar. And heaven rattles when he snores. When the armies of evil needed him in battle, they found that waking Kubakarma um, was a battle all its own. It took a string of lances, blaring horns, and torrents of cold water to rouse him. <laughs> Let's see, next one here. Oh, I love this picture. Okay, let's see if I can position this so you all see. Uh, here he goes. And, uh, just, you know, it's a tall giant, you know, um, and, in, you know, he's standing in front of a coffin. Man, I wish I had better lighting this. Sorry, folks. But I'll position to see the giant while I read this. A Russian behemoth, his weight too great for marshy, marshy lowlands to bear. A mischievous giant named um, 
Sevya Toga Togor uh, roamed the granitic mountains height. Ah, sorry, let me read that again. His height too great for marshy lowlands to bear, and she was giant named Sa um, Savyatogor, roamed the granitic mountain heights of Russia. His end was um, piteous. Accompanied by a human friend, he came upon a mighty coffin and, laughing, shut himself inside. But to Jess was his undoing, for no mortal could lift the lid. Of course, you may wonder how come he can't lift it himself, but I don't know. Maybe there's a special locking mechanism on the inside. Ah, here we go. Something further in the east. Let me see a samurai against a giant, and the giant has a crack cup by its side. So I can position that. As we read here, Deathmonger of the East. In old Japan, no outlaw was more feared than the ogre Shutadoji, who kidnapped innocent striplings and feast on their flesh. Finally, a wily warlord named Reiko tracked a giant to his lair near Kyoto and slyly drugged his wine and then the hero beheaded him. <laughs> nice and simple. Alright, let's keep going. Ah, another moody and atmospheric one. Yeah, see, you know, some little man pulling off a giant helmet's head um, off. A watching head. In Elder Ages, some giants acted as guardians of treasure. Thus, an enchanted giant's head, severed from its trunk but living still, lie up, um, long lay upon the Russian battlefield, guarding a magic sword. The hero Russian, uh, the hero Ruslan, dealt the death blow to the head, then toppled it with, um, toppled it to take the sword, which served as his weapon against the forces of evil. <laughs> Now, in the second chapter, it talks about protectors and providers. Um, I never got to, you know, I never, as I read all the stories in this, you know, I just, you know, mainly as kids just looked at the pictures and read the little captures like I'm doing now. But um, this talks about um, giants further up, and not so much in the ancient mythology, but kind of, it's sort of when they were kind of overlapping into current times when the stories were made. Um, let's see. So you got this story right here. Let's see if I can position this. See a giant carrying off a young person there, a mighty benefactor. Perhaps because they were outcasts themselves, giants, giants themselves show great compassion towards mortals, tossed roughly aside by fate or by their fellows. Here is one such tale: A rich Russian merchant had three sons. The first two he endowed with sleek trading vessels, but for the youngest, Ivan by name, there was only a creaky ship with a ragged sail. Yet Ivan's trading prospered until his ship's hold groaned with gold, and a fair lady joined him in his journey. His success did him no good without his brothers, however. The eldest co um, coveted his maiden, the other was tr uh, the other his treasure. Together he attacked his ship and threw Ivan overboard. Ivan drifted to with a current um, until he washed up on a bleak and unfamiliar shore. A shaggy giant, whose gnarled staff um, stood taller than the ship's mast, stood waiting on, on the shing shingle. Even in his exhaustion, Ivan could still feel fear. Lord, he cried out, spare me. The tale does not say what cruel twists and fortune have brought the giant to, the, to his desolate strand, but it must have been seen that it bound him into sympathy of a tiny castaway, for he did more than spare the intruder. He swung him up on his lofty shoulders and waded to the sea, bearing Ivan safely on his own country. Ivan was quick to reclaim his land and his treasure, and and though the giant soon returned to his lonely haunt, the man he, he had um, stooped to save never forgot him. Ivan told his story to so, um, so many times that the legend of Giant's Mercy became known to all of Russia. <laughs> Almost kind of similar to a plot of Count of Monte Cristo. You know, at least the beginning part. Okay, moving along. Ah, here we go. Um, Scion of the Sea, the giant Brand of Blessed, ruled the island of Britain in early days. It was he, sitting on a state of the cliffs of Wales and gazing far across the water, who first sighted the sails of the King of Ireland, approaching on a faithful, uh, on a faithful embassy. Uh, these pictures that you're seeing here are from the great John Howe. You've noticed his style artwork in um, Lord of the Rings, very famous fantasy artist. Uh, he's done a lot of work in many of these books. Here we got continuing the story here, the giant. And um, to unite the islands of Ireland, Britain, Bran um, tendered to the Irish king, his sister, Brawen, a fair human form and sa um, sacred heritage, heritage, as the companies of the two kings celebrated. However, the king plotted against them both. 
That's one fine picture here. Of course, and a nice uh, black and white drawing here. It's all ships with, um, with a cauldron being lifted out of it. Let's see. When an Irish king left Britain, he carried a treasure given as an honor price for the wrong that was done him. It was a charm cauldron that restored life to the dead. Of course, you can read more details of this in the text itself. I'm just going to go show off all the artwork and see, or read as many of the captions as I can here. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see. Brawin here. I'll position it like so. I'll read the caption at the bottom. Tutored in human speech by Brawin, a star, um, starling braved winds and distances, uh, distances of the Irish Sea to bear home to Brand a tale of her husband's cruelty. So, uh, so she, apparently she needs his help. Ah. See ya. Uh, couple of guards here looking across the ocean and not good news on their part let's see watchmen wove a riddle of the king of ireland off the coast a mountain moved in the wake of a forest crept brawin gave the answer the trees were ship's mass the mountain her brother waiting the seas to free her and of course uh, guy being tied up i'll position this here while i read the caption Let's see. After suing for peace, the Irish conceived a cunning treachery. They built a feast hall for Bran, then hid warriors in sacks they said were full of grain. Bran, Bran's kidsmen um, saw the ruse and crushed each warrior's skull. <laughs> this would make for a very interesting movie. Especially with this scene right here. See a bunch of soldiers attacking and, you know, uh, Bran and his sister Brawin there. They're going against the cauldron, uh, the, the cauldron, and you know, they're apparently not doing well. And the caption reads, British and Irish fought in the feasting hall, and the Irish met ma uh, might with magic, reviving slain warriors in the charmed cauldron. But no Irish spear pierced Bran's shield, a great shield, or harmed Brawin when she se when she sheltered in its ark. And let's see, yep. There's Brand. Brand the Blessed died in Ireland. His severed head, still charged with ancient powers, was carried home to Britain and buried where the guards to guard against all the island's enemies. Let's see, let's go keep going here. Ah uh, yes. Y'all might know this one. A very famous story of King Arthur of Arthurian legends, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. As King Arthur's courtiers celebrate Christmas tide, a great stranger rode a banqueting hall, you know, who, you know, let's see, lifting a severed head to speak, the str uh, stranger admonished Gawain before the amazed throng. You see, a giant comes by and offers a challenge. Gawain was the only one to meet it. He um, offers, you know, Gawain to cut off his head, which he did, but he simply took his head and put it back, and he offers him to come back in a year and, you know, to his, to his home, where, you know, where he might do the favor. So he does so. Chill mist lifted to reveal a shining castle above the trees, beckoning a weary traveler. So the Green Knight goes off hunting. His wife is going to entertain him. And um, Lady sighed sweetly and she pressed upon Gawain a sash that would shield him from harm. What it was in three days. Um, as the giant went hunting, she came by and tried to seduce him. You know, it's the, you know, the handsome Gawain. You know, Gawain. He refused at first, so she gave him a kiss. And as the Green Knight came back, he gave the giant what she offered him. He laughed and he did this a second time. The third time, he was given a sash which would protect him from all harm. You know, but so he's about to get his head cut off, and she's been, he's been given this, you know, that could protect him. So what does he do? Does he take the honorable route um, just to take the giant's, you know, the swing full um, up front, or protect himself so he can live? So the giant does. Uh, let's see. Trial, honor, and courage conclude. Gawain received an ancient giant's blessing. And what the giant does is that he swings twice and intentionally faints. The third time, it nicks his neck. You see him kind of holding his neck right there with a little blood. And the giant told him, says, you know, the first time you know, I fainted, you know, because of the two kisses. The third time, because you wore uh, the sash, shows that you honor your life. Just a little bit more. A small flaw as it is, your deeds will outdo it. That's kind of a, you know, gist of it. But, you know, I do suggest to pick up the book. Oh, yes. A little more horrifying form of giant. A deepening enmity. Em this talks about a young woman kidnapped by a troll. Who, um, 
I think he, you know, plans to mate with her. But um, her son finds a way to, on her journeys. You know, she's running away. This is his home. And, you know, this takes place in Lapland in Scandinavia. I'll put, put this here while I read the caption. In a snowy waste, a troll, uh, a troll country at the world's um, northern rim, a Lap woman named Mari fled her dying captor. Life drained from his horn... Uh, from his horn... Ugh, sorry. Life drained from his horn troll when a mortal man, Mari's son, found a hiding place of the monster's soul. I'm sure we heard similar stories like that. If you're a D&D player, you've heard of the Lich. Um, let's see. This one I always found kind of a weird painting because it looks like a swimming pool, but it looks like they're falling sideways or running across it off a wall. I'll skip the reading here. Um, the fiery death of a Persian killer talks about um, Ifrit's, um, or an Ifrit, or Afrit, um, as they put it right here. And a sorceress and a, had a duel with one. So, just so we can skip, you know, have keep having some time here. That was a very interesting picture. Um, a couple of giants in Scottish kilts. One has a castle in the bag. And the captions on top of here: Matter was mercurial in giants' territory. The Scots said that in the hands of the old ones, a mighty fortress might shrink to the size of a toy. <laughs> Going back to giants and their mythical powers again. Uh, how many kids get this um, or told this story anymore? I we were told this a lot throughout many books and and um, you know throughout school. Um, who knew where giants and their kind might dwell? Even shadows under Scandinavian bridges provided lairs um, for lockstock hungry trolls. The three billy goats gruff, you know, two of them come over it or they convince the troll not to eat it, but the third one was able to fight and throw you know throw it off the bridge and. I'm sure, you know, Red Storm might be more gruesome. Uh, here we go. Um, again, let's what angle this so you can see the picture. Sorry if it's at an angle, but the glare is just terrible. Uh, the caption on the bottom here. Uh, let's see. Let me position this. Some, giant, uh, some giants, great in magic and grasping in nature, acquired human slaves. The Irish giant of the brown beech wood kept three women captive. One he, le he left in her own shape, but for amusement he changed her sisters into a lap dog and a little horse. So, uh, there we go. And uh, we've got this wonderful picture of a guy um, going to some lock vaults. And captured on the bottom here, let me position this. Even against the giant's ancient power, human bravery prevailed. The beechwood giant died because a man found his, um, his castle's heart and took the sword concealed there. So yeah, I'm mean, reading these passages. You know, hopefully, could tempt you into um, getting this book and reading it in detail. Uh, I see a young man, you know, climbing up the stock. I guess you might know what this one is. Strange were the routes of a giant's world. Giant's worlds in Scotland. Once a jewel-like seed thrown in the ground grew in, um, into a vine ladder that twisted to the heavens. The lad who climbed the leafy um, rungs found at the top a kingdom in the clouds. Jack of the Beanstalk. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Giant there at this table, <clears throat> safe in a safe, safe in his cloud castle, a giant slept. But human eyes spied on him, and human greed coveted his treasures. Um, one was a hen that laid gold eggs of solid gold. And let's see. Yep. Yeah, you crush you. Yeah, we're all familiar with this story. But one thing advantage of a book like this is the um, variations of the legends. And the caption there it says, um, Alerted by the cries of his stolen harp, the cloud giant um, pursued the human who had robbed him. But the thief cut the vine and the giant plummeted to his death. Uh, these next few pictures, again, I won't go over the story because I don't... I remember reading it once, but I can't remember what it's about. So uh, we could just enjoy the pictures here. A couple people with a giant dog in the background. Of course, it does involve a giant. A spear about to be thrown of it. Of course, a guy hunting a giant beast. And a giant about to get his head cut off. Sorry if I don't get much of this, it's a bit too long to read. And I don't have much um, r um, space in my camera, so I'm trying to go as much as you can, showing off everything. Ah, a Cyclops, giant himself. See where this is going. You guys are familiar with the Odyssey. And of course, this talks about um, Odysseus and uh, his trial against him. In the course of ten years of venturing in the Mediterranean, Odysseus and his fellow Greeks invaded the island and retreated to Cyclops, one-eyed giants, 
When a giant tra um, trapped him in, in his cave, they put out his eye with a stake. And of course, you know, blind, you know, blind and enraged, he tries to hurl rocks at him, but they manage to escape. As you well, know, again, howling with pain and rage, a blind cyclops fell, um, followed his tormentors to Sicily's rocky shore. He hurled boulders after the investors, but the adventurers escaped with ease. You got many of the stuff you may already know, maybe the stuff you don't hardly ever know. But that's the fun of these books. Ah, here we go. A man after, you know, not a huge giant as the others in before, but still a giant nonetheless. In chivalry's um, golden days, victory over the waning race of giants was proof of valor. So it was with furious delight that the knight Roland challenged the Colossus Ferengus. Uh, here we go. It's a giant on the ground here with a, you know, a spear coming out of its head and a you know, knight on horseback against a giant with a club. Captain reads, without hesitation, without fear, King Arthur's knight Eric set himself against two brutal giants who um, threatened him. One died in an Eric's spear, the other by his sword. <laughs> uh, this talks about a cruel churchman. I'll try and read this one. Times came at last when giants had, uh, when giants and giant trolls were mastered not by human strength but by human trickery. Such was the case in Norway, where it was said that a cleric persuaded a mountain-dwelling troll to do the work of building a church. The price the priest offered was a son, and the troll believed him. Sorry about the glare here. Let me position this a little better. Here we go. Yeah, there's the clergyman. There's the troll. The priest, of course, could not possibly have paid such a price, and indeed never meant to. While the giant creature worked on the church, his employer wandered the mountain searching for the troll's lair. He found it, and from within he heard the troll's female singing her companion's name. This was weapon the priest needed. The trolls were an ancient race, their names were full of magic and not to be given to human keeping. The priest waited until the troll put... Um, put uh, Wait until the troll had put the finishing touches on the tower of the church. When fighting, when standing below the structure while the creature balanced um, on the roof beam, he relented his treacherous payment. Uh, Tevester called the priest, shouting the secret name in, to the winds. The troll gave a horrible cry and fell to the ground, dying before he struck it. <laughs> a clergyman breaking, you know, that shall not bear false witness. You know, especially offering the sign. But, you know, he's only human. Got this picture here, um, you know, the caption down below. Um, let's see. With a, with the howl of the morning animal, one of the giant last giants of France embraced the body of his life's companions. Tricked by an unscrupulous human, the giant had murdered her. And you know, don't know the whole story of that, but again, that's in the text. And coming near the end. Um, Let's see, and, you know, these are, again, these wonderful drawings here. See a giant on the mountain here. Um, on the top here, it mentions uh, the Earth's memory. Sort of position this as I read this. Long after the last giants vanished from the Earth, their imprints lingered on the land, on the landscape, souvenirs of an age of wonder. The trails where generations of giants trod were marked by mountain cliffs and winding valleys. The footprints of giants formed lake beds and massive boulders lay there where giants had hurled them in sport or in anger. No doubt some of the nature's own handiwork was mistakenly ascribed to giants, but many features of the planet seemed to lend themselves to no other explanation. Now, these next few pages will have text on the bottom. I'll position this again while I read. Solitary here's solitary ugh, so sorry. Solitary hills rising from plains were suggestive of the work of giants. Legend held that one sad eyed German giantess, hearing that mortals would destroy her race, raised a mountain on the flats of Brandenburg to block their way. With no tools but her hands, she scooped and sculpted and then she spiked the earth and barren with trees and stone. It it was a pitiful effort in truth, and the mountain was more an object of amazement than an impediment. And next picture here. Oh, a giant working on these huge column like structures. You might know these from Ireland. You know, the giant's call you know, hey, notice that these you know, if you go to Ireland to this structure, you know, it's called the giant's causeways. Well here's the story. At the lands ending in the north of Ireland, the folk of Ulster say a giant once stared out to sea for days at a time, pining for a woman of the Isle of Staffa in the distant of um he hip um Hebrides or Hebrides. Finally he set to work 
placing thick stone columns side by side to build a road across the water so that he might reach his love. When the giant achieved his goal, uh, whether the giant achieved his goal is not known, but a fragment of that causeway st um, stands st uh, there still, yearning out towards Staffa, a hundred miles away. Hmm. Now here's one um, again. Let me kind of hard to position this, but what it is, you got this waterfall here, and you got this troll slashing with a sword. Put that position here while I read it. A deep canyon slashing a mountainside in, um, in the central highlands of Norway was said to have been made by a giant troll who schemed to divert the waters of the river Gloma down to um, Rendalen, his native valley far, um, far below. The troll, however, had a jealous neighbor, a behemoth, who watched over the river, and this creature slew the would-be thief of the waters. So the Troll Canyon was unfinished, and the river continues to flow in, the, in, um, in its rightful bed. <laughs> uh, this one is of a giant in great, you know, embedded into the ground. Let's see. The earth was created from the slain giant's body. Ancient tells it cleared, and into the earth all giants descended when their day was done. One British giant, measuring 240 feet from crown to toe, left his form on the Sussex Hill when he fell. Muscle, blood, and bone dissolved, leaving only a vast silhouette sunk into the chalky downs. Peasants called him the Long Man of Willing uh, Willington. And graze their sheep, uh, you know, and graze their sheep about the massive legs of, uh, and wide-flung arms. <laughs> uh, giant, giant, walking past the village here, over the hills and everything. Looks like he's carrying mountains in his sack right here. The hilly coast of the Baltic island of Rügen had its origin in a giant's in a giant's misfortune. In order that he might cross Dayshod from his island to the shores of. Um, Pomerania, a fellow thought uh, to fill the sea between them. But the bulging sack in which he hauled the stones he had collected for the task it was ripped open by, a st uh, by the steeple of the church. The great stones fell out to be wasted as a line of use uh, useless hills. At that, the giant quit in vexation and left the area for good. <laughs> and that, I believe, ladies and gentlemen, is the end. We have the picture credits right here, bibliography of all the stories. You know, same format as the time. There you go. Thank you very much for watching. Giants and Ogres, if you know such a if you like this, uh, pick up a copy of this and thank you all for watching. You have a nice day.